whom Chomsky occupy. So, Howard Zinn had wrote, where progress has been made, wherever any kind of injustice has been overturned has been because people acted as citizens and not as politicians. They didn't just moan, they worked, they acted, they organized, they rioted if necessary to bring their situation to the attention of people in power. And that's what we have to do today. Some people might say, well, what do you expect? And the answer is that we expect a lot. People say, oh, what, are you a dreamer? And the answer is yes, we're dreamers. We want it all. It is in that spirit, in Howard Zinn's beautiful spirit, that we invite you to join us in launching this new project. May 10 million flowers bloom. Greg Ruggiero, March 12, 2012. Another world is possible. Make ready your dreams. I still can't eat GNP, but I can see climate change out my window. So whenever Chomsky thinks about Howard, which is quite often, particularly in the light of the Occupied Movement, there are words of his that always resonate in my mind. Uh, they are his call to focus our attention on the countless small actions of unknown people. That are the foundation for those great moments that ultimately enter the historical record without the countless small actions of unknown people that created them. And that's a fundamental truth of history. And it's one that his work and in, his, in fact his life did a great deal to illuminate. And it's no exaggeration to say that he literally changed the consciousness and also the conscience of an entire generation. And that's no small achievement. And it continues and it expands the people's history. So Howard Zinn Memorial Lecture could not have been better timed. It's taken place in the midst of countless small actions of unknown people who are rising. The Occupy Movement is an extremely exciting development. In fact, it's kind of spectacular. It's unprecedented. There's never been anything like it that I can think of. If the bonds and associations that are being established in these remarkable events can be sustained through a long, hard period ahead, because a victory won't come quickly, it could turn out to be a really historic and quite significant moment in American history. The fact that the Occupy Movement is unprecedented is quite appropriate. It's, unpre it's an unprecedented era, not just this moment, but since the 1970s, on the history of the U.S. economy. The 1970s began a major turning point in American history. For centuries since the country began, it had been a developing society, and not always in very pretty ways. That's another story. But it was a developing society with ups and downs, but the general progress was towards wealth, industrialization, development, and hope. There was a pretty constant expectation that it was going to go on like this. And that was true even in very dark times. Chomsky was just old enough to remember the Great Depression. After the first few weeks, by the mid-1930s, although the situation was objecti objectively much harsher than it is today, nevertheless, the spirit was quite different. There was a sense that we're going to get out of this, even among unemployed people, including a lot of my relatives, a sense that it will get better. There was a militant labor union organizing. There was militant labor union organizing, especially CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, organizing going on. It was getting to the point of sit-down strikes, which are really very frightening to the business world. You could see it in the business press at the time because a sit-down strike is just one step before taking over the factory and running it yourself. So instead of not just showing up, just sitting down and saying, we ain't work. We're going to occupy and we ain't going to work until our demands are met. Especially if you work in a restaurant, do it on a Friday or Saturday night. And it would work if they all, if there was solidarity, if they all stood in solidarity. Which, uh, it's frightening to the business world because it's just one step before taking over the factory and running it yourself. The idea of worker takeovers is something which is incidentally very much on the agenda today and we should keep it in mind. I'll come back to it. Also, the New Deal legislations were beginning to come in as a result of popular pressure. Despite the hard times, there was a sense that somehow we're going to get out of it. But it's quite different now. For many people in the United States, there's a kind of pervasive sense of hopelessness. Sometimes despair, and I think it's quite new in American history, and it has an objective basis. There's a reason why a lot of people are frustrated and angry. So, in the 1930s, unemployed working people could anticipate that their jobs would come back. If you're a worker in manufacturing today, the current level of unemployment in manufacturing is approximately like the Depression. So, factory employment is down. 25% unemployed is the Great Depression overall and we're around 14 percent so overall we're not the Great Depression 
but in manufacturing we are. And current tendencies persist. Those jobs aren't going to come back. The change took place in the 1970s. There's a lot of reasons for the changes. One of the underlying factors discussed mainly by economic historian Robert Brenner was the falling rate of profit in manufacturing. There are other factors that led to major changes in the economy, a reversal of several hundred years of progress towards industrialization and development, and that turned to a process of deindustrialization and de-development. Of course, manufacturing production continued overseas, very profitable, but no good for the workforce. Along with that came a significant shift of the economy. The economy shifted from productive enterprise, producing things people need or could use, to financial manipulation. The financialization of the economy really took off at that time. I heard that the whole thing is a pyramid scheme. Anyways, on the banks, before the 1970s, banks were banks. They did what banks were supposed to do in a state capitalist economy. A state capitalist. So they took unused funds from your bank account, for example, and they transferred them to some potentially useful purpose, like helping some family buy a home or send a kid to college or whatever it might be. That changed dramatically in the 1970s. Until then, there were no financial crises until the 1970s. The, before then, it was a period of enormous growth, the highest growth in American history, maybe in economic history, sustained growth through the 1950s and 1960s. And it was egalitarian. The, so the lowest quintile did as well as the highest quintile. Lots of people moved into reasonable lifestyles. What's called here middle class. Working class as it's called in other countries. But it was real. And the 1960s accelerated it. The activism of the 1960s after a pretty dismal decade really civilized the country in lots of ways that are permanent. And they're not changing. They're staying on. When the 1970s came along there was a sudden, there were sudden and sharp changes. There is deindustrialization, offshoring of production, and shifting to financial institutions with, which grew enormously. I should say that in the 1950s and 1960s there was also the development of what several decades later became the high-tech economy. Computers, the internet, the IT revolution mostly developed in the 1950s and 1960s, substantially in the state sector. It took a couple of decades before it took off but it was developed there. The developments that took place during the 1970s set off a vicious cycle. It led to concentration of wealth increasingly in the hands of the financial sector. That doesn't benefit the economy. It probably harms it and the society, but it did lead to tremendous concentration of wealth substantially there on politics and money. So, I don't know, I didn't really mark much of this. So, uh, there's a cycle that's resulted in a tremendous concentration of wealth, mainly in the top one-tenth of one percent of the population. So the 99 percent isn't exactly right. It's not the one percent who controls America, but it's the one-tenth of one percent. So really we are the 99.9 percent. We are the 99.9 percent. We are the 99.9 percent. So meanwhile for the general population it began to open a period of stagnation and even decline for the majority. So wages have been stagnated since the 1970s in America. Uh, whereas corporations and CEOs are making record profits, the amount of income that working class people in America have been making is the exact same, uh, if not less, than uh, what they would make in the 1970s, you know, give uh, for, uh, for inflation, if you take inflation into account. So it's comparable. People got by, but they got by by artificial means, such as longer working hours, higher rates of borrowing and debt, and reliance on asset inflation, like the recent uh, housing bubble. So they were relying on asset inflation. They were lying about the toxic assets that they actually had. Pretty soon, those working hours were much higher in the United States than in other industrial uh, countries like Japan and those in Europe. So there was a period of stagnation and decline for the majority that continued alongside a period of sharp concentration of wealth. The political system began to dissolve. There had always been a gap between public policy and public will, and it just grew astronomically. You can see it right now, in fact. Take a look at what's happening right now. The big topic in Washington that everyone concentrates on is the deficit. For the public, correctly, the deficit is not regarded as much of an issue, and it really isn't much of an issue. The issue is joblessness, not the deficit. It's poverty. It's homelessness. So there's a deficit commission, but there's no joblessness commission. As far as the deficit concerned, the public has opinions. Take a look at the polls. The public overwhelmingly supports higher taxes on the wealthy, which have declined sharply in this period of stagnation and decline. Higher taxes on the wealthy 
uh, and preserve the limited social benefits. So keep the welfare programs, keep the food stamps, keep the social security, and keep the Medicaid and the Medicare and the WIC. I think WIC is social programs. Education, public um, universities, post offices, police departments, fire departments, politicians. There's there's one group of folks that we might actually benefit from just getting rid of the quit paying the politicians. Actually, if you made the politicians uh, work for minimum wage, you watch how quick minimum wage would actually go up. So, on economics, he talks a little bit about Adam Smith and the Invisible Hand. Um, without going into details, what's been playing out for the past 30 years is actually a nightmare that was anticipated by the classical economist. Adam Smith considered the possibility that merchants and manufacturers in England might decide to do their business abroad, invest abroad, and import from abroad. He said they would profit, but England would be harmed. However, he went on to say that the merchants and manufacturers would prefer to operate in their own country, what's sometimes called a home bias. So as if by an invisible hand, England would be safe from the ravages of what is now called neoliberal globalization. That's a pretty hard passage to miss. In this classic wealth of nations, that's the only occurrence of the phrase, invisible hand. Maybe England would be safe from neoliberal globalization by an invisible hand. So uh, the imagery is awesome by the Occupy for the 1% even less, the one-tenth of 1%. It's fine. They're doing well. They're rich. They're getting richer. More powerful, they control the whole system, they disregard the public, they love it, they're having a party. The owners of society, um, like the aristocrats in Lexington that were involved in Drew Thornton's uh, death in 1985, they're having a good old time, just a, a good old aristocratic let them eat cake type of time. So if they can continue as far as they're concerned, why not? Why shouldn't they keep on having a big party at the public's concern? Uh, but this was Adam Smith and what David Ricardo had warned us about. So take, for example, Citigroup. For decades, Citigroup has been one of the most corrupt of the major investment banking corporations repeatedly bailed out by the taxpayer, starting in the early Reagan years and now once again. I won't run through the corruption. You probably already know about it, but it's pretty astonishing. In 2005, Citigroup came out with a brochure for investors called Plutonomy, Buying Luxury, Explaining Global Imbalances. The uh, brochure urged investors to put money into a plutonomy index. The memo says the world is dividing into two blocks, the plutonomy and the rest. Plutonomy refers to the rich, those who buy luxury goods and so on, and that's where the action is. They said that their plutonomy index was way outperforming the stock market, so people should put money into it. As for the rest, we send them adrift. We don't really care about them. We don't really need them. They have to be around to provide a powerful state, which will protect us and bail us out when we get into trouble, but other than that, they have essentially have no function. These days, they're sometimes called the precariat, people who live in a precarious existence at the periphery of society. It's not the periphery anymore. It's become a very substantial part of the society in the United States, and indeed es elsewhere. And this is considered a good thing. For example, Alan Greenspan at the time when he was still St. Alan held by the economics profession as one of the greatest economists of all time, and this was before the crash, which he was substantially responsible for in 2008, Alan Green, Greenspan's crash. He was testifying to Congress in the Clinton years, and he explained the wonders of the great economy he was supervising. He said a lot of the success of this economy was based substantially on what he called grower worker insecurity. If working people are insecure, then they're part of what we now call the precariat, living precarious existences. They're not going to make demands. They're not going to try to get wages. They won't get benefits. We can kick them out if we don't need them. And that's what's called a healthy society, technically. If he was very praised for this, he was very praised for this, and he is greatly admired. That's Alan Greenspan. Well, now the world is indeed splitting into a plutonomy and a precariat. Again, in the imagery of the occupied movement, the 1% and the 99%. Not literal numbers, but the right picture. Now the plutonomy is where the action is. Well, it could continue like this. It does not continue, if it does not continue like this, the historical reversal that began in the 1970s could become irreversible. And that's where we're heading. And the Occupy Movement is the first real major popular reaction could, that could avert this. But that, as I said, it's going to be necessary to face the fact that it's a long, hard struggle. You don't win victories tomorrow. You have to go on uh, to form the structures that will be sustained, that will go on through hard times and can win major victories. And there are a lot of things that can be done. Revolution will, will not happen if we think we can 
reform the system. And there does seem to be ways to reform the system. But when reform doesn't work, then revolution becomes inevitable.